And in 1995, I was in a psychiatric institution with major anxiety disorder, panic disorder, PTSD, and depression. So welcome to the conference. I'm so happy you're here. And so I don't mean to be flip, I really don't, but it's my story and I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed. It's why I'm here with you today. I am Tammy West and that is my story. Welcome to Consider Yourself Hugged, a place to find comfort and support as you navigate your mental and emotional well-being. So sit back and relax unless you're driving and get ready for this week's hug. Hello. Hi. We haven't been together in two weeks and I would say that I've missed you, but I mean, you all listeners, watchers, you know that Michelle and I are very, very good friends. So it's not like this is the only time we get together, but I've missed this. Yes, me too. I've missed this. And I'm excited because the couple times where we've talked about it, you've been really excited about this module. And I'm we really- try not to talk about it before we record because then all the good stuff is done. And it's so we haven't really talked about it. Other than me just saying I'm super excited because I feel like it's, I mean, and it's not a very long module, but still there's a lot here yeah. in terms of like how deep it is. And you, so I recorded by myself. Like if, if you all have listened or watched to last week, I just did like three little nuggets that I've taken away from this. We just weren't able to make the recording work together, but I've mentioned several times, I mean, I did a a keynote for some behavioral health people this past week and, and, and all of my webinars that I do for the EAP program, I've just keep, it's hard to put into words how doing this has really just changed me. And I think it's changed you too. And it's this concept of like being committed to it and actually engaging in it. So I don't remember what my three nuggets were last week, but definitely go back and and check them out. One of them was from Christy McClelland, who (laughs) I've been talking a lot about her lately too. She's, if you don't know her, we'll put some links in the show notes, but she's a, she's a scholar, a a Bible teacher, a professor, and she just teaches the Bible through a Middle Eastern lens instead of through what we know here in the West. So I've learned a lot of lessons there too. Yes, she is amazing. Yeah, she's amazing. We just talked about her before we started recording. Well, but before we get into module eight, we usually recap a little bit from module seven. So any, and that was our optimism, optimism and motivation. Did you have anything to recap on that? I really liked the three um, questions The okay, why am I doing this? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so like I found myself throughout the week, if there was something, whether it was um, like wasting time scrolling or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, really anything like, why am I doing this? You know, is there a feeling that I am, you know, using that to, to change Mm -hmm. and, um, what could I be doing differently? So like asking all of those things was really helpful. It really helps to redirect time, not to say that, that those aren't, um, I mean, those things aren't certainly always bad things, scrolling, watching TV and so forth, but a lot of it does depend on why you're doing it. If you're doing it to take a few minutes to de-stress, that's one situation. If you're doing it for 30 minutes yeah, because you're anxious, that's a different situation altogether. It's about being, just being aware that you're doing it. So you're allowed to make it a choice. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. You had mentioned that when we did it before. And when you mentioned it, it caused me to go and focus more on it. And, and I felt the same way. And by the way, if you're <clears throat> every single week, I think we both forget to tell people, um, this is, this is a 10 week module. So certainly you can listen today and always you can glean something from it, especially because each module kind of stands by itself. However, it still builds on each other. So like right now, if we're recapping module seven, so definitely go back and look. But th- so this, what we're talking about right now is just recapping and then there's an activity sheet. And if you've done the activity sheet, what Michelle's talking about is number two, where throughout the day you reflect on those questions. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? How do I feel about it? And then Michelle actually is going a little bit further too about 
how you can look at the behavior and change it. So, but I paid particular attention to that too. And I, I actually wrote down like one of the activities that I'm still, it's so much better, but I'm still struggling is worrying. So, and I, and I tried to pay attention and write it down. Like, what am I doing? Worrying. And one of the things I noticed, and I think a lot of people will connect with this. I don't know if we've talked about this or if you do it, Michelle, but when you catch yourself like pausing for a minute and going, wait a minute, wasn't I just worrying about something? What was it? Do you do that? Mm-mm. No. <gasps> wow. I thought everybody <laughs> did it. I was like, like, okay, wait, I was just worrying about something. What was it? What was it? Oh, right, right. That's what I was worrying about. So I guess it's an anxiety thing. You and I are a little, you know, your thing that you battle is more depression related and mine is more anxiety yes. related. So I wrote down worrying and then I put, why am I doing it? And there's a lot of things to write down, but I think part of it is just habit. Like it's habit and I have to catch myself. How do I feel about it? Well, I freaking feel bad. (laughs) So, you know, just catching it in the moment was really important to me. And and then the only other thing that, well, there were a couple others, but the only one that I'll, that I'll mention is because this one was about optimism and motivation. And I went back and I don't know if you remember, but back in module three, module three was about happiness and well-being. And one of the assessments was whether you considered yourself an unhappy or a happy person, happier than most of your family and friends. And that's kind of what I, let's see, how did I, how did I frame this? I was equating, I guess, recently, when you think about being optimistic, there's so much out there now with politics and religion and negativity. And so when we talked about like being optimistic versus being pessimistic, I find myself when I'm listening to like the news or conversations that are just so pessimistic and negative about things like, you know, the world. And although I'm like, you all that have been with this before, positive psychology is not toxic positivity. It's not about rose colored glasses or, but it is when you start trying to incorporate more things like optimism and positivity, it gets harder and harder to sit in that for a long period of time. I mean, have you noticed that at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that since doing this course, I have been way more aware of conversations that um, linger on that. And what I mean by that is I'm not one who um, will watch the news much in terms of I don't take in a lot of that. I try to to have a baseline knowledge of, of what's going on and, yes. um, you know, like approach it of like, all right, this is going on. Obviously, I don't think this is great. What well, is there anything that I can do any response? And if there's not kind of moving on, but I do have people in my life um, that will dwell on it that will see something on the news and be like well did you see xyz and like this is so you know awful and you know and i've noticed that that does affect me Mm. and so i have redirected a little bit if that makes sense because it does affect my mood yeah it does affect my positivity so even though i'm not the one engaging in it I don't necessarily want to dwell on those conversations. Yeah. Either. And and because of what's going on in the, the country, it's an election year. Obviously there's a lot of that. Yes. Going on right now. So uh, much so, of that. And yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's got about what a month of, I don't, I mean, not that, that all that's going to go away once the election happens, but leading up to it, it's just, it's so much. And yeah. And I have, and I'm trying not to be like, like judgmental or critical about other people. I just don't, 
I just, I don't want to, I just don't well, want to engage in it. I guess I've never really like, if, if it's not spurring us on to do something different, like if it were, you know, making us more engaged, if there was something different we could do mm -hmm. as a result of being kind of rallied that way, I think it would be a different situation. But I think a lot of times it's just building up of negative emotion that we really don't have anywhere to go with it. Yes, we should all vote. <laughs> yes, like, you know, if, if you have a candidate you really believe in, you should, you know, do things to support that. But if Other there's than nothing else, then other than building negative energy, what's the productivity of it? Yeah, no, it's not. And that, I mean, gosh, that could go a million different directions, but, ah, but we won't, we won't do that because everybody, <laughs> everybody, everybody knows how we are. Yes, <laughs> we could. Obviously. We could, we could. Well, in this series, I think that the thing you might have noticed too, you who are, you know, our wonderful listeners and, and viewers is that the module, the, our episodes have been much longer um, because there is a lot to talk about. And sometimes with our, the shorter episodes in the past, it's just because we've been, you know, and they, I, we've loved doing them, but it's just, we've talked about a few things and then, but this, you know, we introduce the topic and then we we just mention the activities and then we do them over the week and then we come back and then we talk about what we've learned and then we introduce the next thing. And it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. So let's jump in. You want to, to module eight? Yeah. Sounds great. I'm going to let you, you jump in in a second. The only thing I want to do is just a, a quick recap because as we look at this, this field of positive psychology, which was introduced in the very first week, but it's built on this model called PERMA. And in the future, as I go further with this and begin to teach it more and maybe coach it, I'm probably going to tweak it a little bit just because, I don't know. Well, maybe when it's finished, it's jumped around a little bit. Like, so PERMA, these five pillars of positive psychology are positive emotions, which there was one. I think one module that focused just on that, but that's permeated everything. I think the positive emotions, you know, we've talked about the app, how we feel. So that's just been ever present. The second, the letter E is engagement. And it doesn't really specify in this module, except maybe once it mentions it, but that's really what I see this about being about. It's present moment and mindfulness is what we're talking about today. So being engaged and then, the letter R is relationships, which has permeated some, but next week we'll focus on that. And then meaning and accomplishment. We did one whole module on that. But I feel like today, present moment in mindfulness is is built on, in part, just being engaged with what you're doing. So what, tell me why it was like such an exciting thing for you to do this one. It, I realized kind of as going, as we were, as I was going through it, that um, there is a separation between like mindfulness engaging in the moment and being calm and mindful depending on the moment. And so I don't know that that makes sense as I said it, but for example, it, it talked a lot about like being mindful. It talked, it gave an example of a woman in a store mm -hmm. who was worrying about other things throughout the rest of the day. And so it was really saying that like in order to help with that, you stay engaged, you stay present in exactly where you are. And you and I, when we were doing um, an educator series, we looked at like some different research on like a mindfulness meditation activity that a school did. Oh yeah. Teachers, you need to talk. Yes. Talk the, about the that. teachers found very helpful, but they found that when the students were engaged in it, that it did not improve the same metrics for students. And they were kind of asking why in terms of like, and, and they're like, well, you know, the teachers volunteered for it. The students didn't, but some of it, I think has to do with the perceived reality of the moment. And so like, if you have a student who's sitting there very tense and upset, worried about a test, 
their reality of the moment is different than someone else's. And so, and I'll use the example as well. Like if you're in a store grocery shopping, you do have certain things you're worried about versus like if you're in a situation, whether you're a teacher, a nurse, um, a mom who has a, a two-year-old who's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, having a tantrum, like the stress of that moment and being mindful and present in that moment is different than a moment where you're in, you're in the store thinking about those things. I don't know, it's, you know um, like, so like being aware both as someone like being an instructor, being a parent, being a coach, being a friend, being aware that those are two separate things. That if if someone is right in the middle of something horrific and you're saying you should just be mindful, um, gotcha. that doesn't necessarily always mean the same thing. So I think it just helped me see a brighter, pers a broader perspective of mindfulness, why it's helpful, when it's helpful, when it's not helpful, why it's not helpful, and to understand it a little better. So that was the exciting part. So I don't know if I articulated that to where it made sense, but. No, you really did. Cause I think what th I'm going to talk about this book chatter, which you've heard me mention before, because it is absolutely right in line with this. But one of the things he says, which relates to you is that here in the 21st century, we take this thing mindfulness and we just, we, we lump, we say that it's, oh, just simply letting your mind go and being, and that that's not realistic. And we call, we just, we lump everything under it, like mindfulness, just be present. But what you just did is you were like, well, yeah, but it's, it's more than that. You know, it, there's a lot of dimensions to it. And I think sometimes telling people that they should, first of all, just, we need to, we need to remove that word. <laughs> from a lot of our conversations, right? Just be mindful or just calm down or just be present. But telling someone, you know, to practice mindfulness can be very overwhelming and not necessarily helpful unless we can break it down into exactly what you just said, what it is, when it's helpful, when it's not, when it's all those things. Yeah. I mean, because I think there's times where people like, like the concept of, oh, you know, What's your happy place? I mean, if you've ever heard a therapist ask you about your happy place, like having someone connect to a space that's very calming for them, but it isn't exactly like in the moment, but to help them be calm in the moment, you know, so there, you're right. There's a lot of different facets to it. And, you know, depending on those students in that study, we don't know kind of where they were or what was going on with them or whether being present and all like listening to their breathing at that moment. Like it's, we don't know kind of what was going on there. Send me the link if you don't mind. Cause I don't know if it's any, in any of our materials that we've presented at schools before, but, but someone might be interested in reading yeah. it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I made a note. So I'll remind you so far. We've talked about the Christy links and this link. Okay. So I try to keep up, but I don't always keep up. Um, okay, well then let's do a little bit of, and just jump in whenever, but I thought the way that, that the module flows here is like setting the stage and, and this struck me and I'm going to incorporate it with the chatter that they cited a recent study, but sometimes in the, in this module, they don't tell us where the studies come from, but a recent study has shown that we spend at least 50% of our time absent from the present moment, and that this state of distraction causes adverse effects on our mental health. We are elsewhere, our absence, when we are elsewhere, our absence can accel accelerate cellular aging. I tried to find that, I don't know, but I'm gonna push back on that a little bit. Did you, did you feel any certain way about saying that being absent from the present moment 50% of the time can have adverse effects? I agree, but... I also want to push back a little. I, I think it, again, I'd say the same thing. It depends on what the present moment is. Yeah. I mean, well, I see that more than anything else when it comes to trauma, people with severe trauma. I mean, dissociation 
I think it's being understood more and more. And it doesn't mean like being a different person, but I think like people detaching from emotions because of certain things from the past. Like, I think that, um, that is, is something that is a, a real thing. So I think, again, depends on what that moment is. It depends. Yeah. And that, that's why I love like all the things that we're bringing to it. So let me go back to, um, and I'll put a link to the chatter book, which I think I've done before, but it's very research. I mean, this module is very research-based, um, but research can mean a lot, right? I mean, we can pull in other things. So I, I just wanted to read a few things that I took from this. So living, and these are direct quotes. Living in the present is a widespread mantra, but human brains are not designed to stay in the present constantly. And that took some pressure off of me. Like, you know, it's like, oh, be mindful, be mindful, be in the moment, be in the moment. But our minds are not wired that way. Um, our default state involves frequent mind wandering, which occupies one third to one half of our waking hours, which is kind of what, you know, 50% of our time not in the present. Okay, a couple more things. The inner voice. Well, now let me come back to that. This, this I loved. I don't. I just loved this because it puts it into perspective. Okay, we engage in this industrious verbal stream of thought, speaking internally at a rate of 4,000 words per minute. And this is equivalent to listening to about 320 State of the Union addresses every day. So the key is not to stop the internal talk, but to manage it. Okay, so going a little bit further, working memory allows us to perform perform multiple tasks simultaneously. Kind of like the woman in the grocery store, and that not, might not be the best example, but like reminding kids to brush their teeth while thinking about a meeting or sitting with a group of friends at a restaurant. They're talking, we're reading the menu, we can order, but we can also maintain those connections. Um, we can also think about a meeting that's coming up. And he talks about this phonological loop, which is a key way, which I don't know that we want to go that far, but but I'll I'll put a link to it. But it helps us develop language control in our minds. So our inner voice, which is talking and going back and forth, helps us track progress towards goals. It lets us run mental simulations. It helps us make decisions. It's influenced by our culture, our parents, our generation, all of these things. So I guess the bottom line on this is just that we, the the voice that's talking, forming simulations, going forward, mental time travel, going backwards is a normal thing to do. But the goal is when it to to harness it and manage it does that make sense yeah perfect sense perfect sense um so let me go back to, to our module because i i marked some things um but people who who don't really spend time in the present moment are seen as not being necessarily happy but in the module, it says our thoughts don't just come by randomly. They all have a purpose, which is kind of what we were saying there, a purpose to guide us, to help us run simulations, to help us. All of those thoughts have a purpose. But then this sentence is on page two. two and when I'm, I'm saying that to Michelle, not to you all, because it's just in our like, you know, our guide in the middle of page two, I highlighted it when left unkempt our mind can become a breeding ground for chaos where our emotions and our impulses tug us left and right. That's when it becomes a real problem. Um, let's see. What did I, and that, that's, that's when this concept of chatter that comes from this book is, so chatter refers to cyclical negative thoughts and emotions that make introspection harmful so instead of tapping into our inner coach we tap into our inner critic which jeopardizes our performance our decision making our relationships our happiness and our health so if i put all of that into like a, a quick summary it would be having thoughts that 
that ping like train of thought going forward, going backward, that's all normal. But when, when it keeps us from being able to be present in the moment at all, or it's tapping into this inner critic and it's spiraling or worrying, then that's when it really harms our health. Yeah. And and I think it, like also not, um, the, the wonderful thing about mindfulness is that it is supposed to help you get in touch with how your body's feeling, what's going on with your body at the moment. And so knowing that does allow you, if it's not something that you're used to checking in with yourself about, it does allow you to change some things that aren't healthy for you. Like if you notice something is, is causing real discomfort or something um, along those lines, then it's just kind of a sign. Okay. Then maybe some changes need to be made. Yeah. So I think that, um, that is, is definitely a positive at the same time. Like I said before, you can't always in the moment, like check in depending on what's going on. I think, um, you know, using the example of if you're a teacher and a student just got upset and they threw a chair across the room, or if you, um, you know, are working um, as a nurse in an ICU when something's not going well, you can't necessarily stop and be like, okay, you know, how am I feeling right now? How am now? I feeling about this situation? Yes. Yeah. And you absolutely can do that after that present moment, you know, after that moment is passed. Um, but in the moment, sometimes we don't always get to do that. Do you think then it's safe to say that the more we can do what you're saying, focus in the moment when things are fairly calm or average or life is just going on, the more we can do that, then the more when things like a crisis or a situation where we don't have a moment to pause on that, the more we can get through that and we'll be more likely to come back to it and process it. Oh, I think so. And I think it's about practice. You, yeah, I think it is. Like, um, and I think the the more you do it, the quicker, like you said, you do come back to to the the calm of that situation or being able to to process that emotion. You know, I'm I've said this before, but I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that mindfulness has not been a real big part of my life up until recently just hasn't um i guess you you hear the word and it just feels i don't know it feels maybe overwhelming that there's this pressure that you're supposed to just let your mind go free and just but that's not that's not really what it is and it's moments it's like mindful moments i mean and we equate mindfulness with meditation and they're two different things, and they're both good. Um, I am jumping around a little bit because I, let's talk about specifically mindfulness. And so I'm moving a little bit further. But what what it talks about here is mindfulness can be broken down into three attitudes. The first attitude consists of a complete focus on your personal experience at the moment. And that's what Michelle was talking about, your breathing your sensations, your emotional states. And I think that from the start of this, using that app has encouraged me to do that, like stopping for a minute. And even if I'm not using the app, it, I can stop and say, um, huh, <laughs> you know, I just felt this, whatever, flood of adrenaline and now I feel a little tense and what is the emotion and what is the thoughts? So the first thing is just focusing completely on the experience in the moment. And then second, disconnecting from our tendency to want to judge it and control it. So like, ooh, I don't want to feel that and that's terrible and I want that to go away. And that's kind of what you were talking about, I think anyway, with am I just scrolling in order to push something away. Is that what yeah. kind of what you were talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. What am I trying to avoid in this moment by doing this? So 
And that's a big one. Like the first attitude, focusing on it. The second attitude is disconnecting from that habit, tendency to want to judge it. And then the third is being aware, observing and experiencing without analyzing anything. So it really is about being present in the moment without judgment. Um, so yeah, that's, that's mindfulness in just three sentences. It's intentionally being present in the moment. And, and also understanding kind of, like you said, that it's not intended to be like 100% of the time. I mean, like, I feel like you and I are both planners. We're planners. We're big idea ideas people. And so a lot of times, like if I'm walking and we, or different areas, like I'm thinking about something or I got an idea for something. I'm like, Oh, well, you know, where could this go? And so like, I feel like I know I do a lot of that. I feel like you do quite a bit of that too. Yeah, and yeah. so like their personality wise, you know, that I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think that this is just saying that there are certain times being intentional and present in the moment are really relaxing. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you said it that way because that is absolutely, that's why it's mindful moments. You can't like, we are designed to mentally time travel and go forward and backwards. And I mean, it's, it's the way our brains are wired and it's a good thing. It allows us to do the things that we do. But then we need to have those moments. And I am still, I don't think I would have been ready to talk about this as much had we not gone through the other modules. Like I am still doing that one minute and I try to time it, which I need to stop doing that. But the sun is coming, the sun comes up at different times. You know, when I'm, if you haven't listened to the other modules, I mean, I've talked about this over and over, but there's a spot in my neighborhood where there's water in the pool and it, they have a little fountain and then the sun comes up and I did it this morning and I'm like, okay, Charlie sit. And then just, just that moment of putting my face to the sun, but it's easy. Like what you just said, cause I'm on a walk. So it's easy for me to start. Oh, well, when I get back, so it's, a, mm -hmm. it's been a practice of just like, sometimes I'll open my eyes just a little, but I try not to, cause I'm faced directly to the sun but then I can see it for a minute. And then sometimes I'll turn to the side and open. And if I hadn't been doing that, I don't think I'd feel as comfortable talking about this at this point. I mean, because those are joyous moments that we take throughout the day to, to do things like that. And it's not, um, like I said, it's not realistic to think that that's going to be like an all day thing. Yeah. So I think it's a combination though, right? Of doing it just because you want to and having a moment of joy. That's one way to be mindful. And then another way to be mindful is if you feel a sensation, unless, you know, like you said, there are times if you're like a nurse working in ICU and you feel a sensation, you got to <laughs> take care of that patient. But if you're just like working or you just had a conversation with someone or, you know, you just maybe relived something in your mind and you're like, and that would be another great time to be mindful to just stop and feel it and process it. What are my emotions? What are my thoughts? Try not to just push it away. Just really observe it. Right. Right. So yeah, we're, we are absolutely not saying you should meditate all day long and go live on a commune. That That's not what we're saying with this module. But if you want to go ahead. You can. Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> but there's balance. We're just talking about, and that's what this module is saying. There's balance with this. Yes, there's balance. And that's it. So, all right. So you just mentioned meditation. So let's move on to that. Um, meditation is one way that you can be mindful, but I, I kind of liked, did you read these seven, these seven pillars of mindfulness meditation? Yes. So, and we'll put, I didn't actually look up a link to this person, but I'll try to find one. It's John Kabat-Zinn. Um, I have a book from him. I can, oh, you do? I can send you some stuff, yeah. Okay. Have you, I did not know that. So it's the physician who introduced mindfulness meditation to the West, to us here in the West, about deliberately paying attention to your experiences, 
without making judgment. Um, but he specifically talks about the practice of mindfulness based on seven pillars, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, okay. Number one is non-judgment, which we talked about. Number two, this is so good. Patience, accepting that changing our habits takes time and requires consistent and sustainable effort. The third is having a beginner's mindset. Begin each meditation as a beginner would without any preconceived notion. Number four, confidence. I found this to be really important because just saying, okay, I can change things. I really can use this and tap into myself and I can do it. Number five, non-effort, practicing meditation with no other goal than just to be. I find that one a little hard. Do you? Mm, I think that. Because I think we're both goal oriented, I guess is yeah, what I think. So I, I think that like for any length of time, yeah, short meditations, but for longer meditations, yes, absolutely. That is definitely difficult to not have those other thoughts. Yeah. Like popping in my head. Popping That's just in. how I made. Yeah. Um, number six, acceptance of what is in the present moment, just as it is. And number seven, letting go, which allows your mind to stop clinging to pleasant thoughts, which allows the mind to stop clinging to pleasant thoughts and sensation. Wait. Not necessarily refusing unpleasant emotions. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought I understood that, but then, you know, when you read something and then I'm like, wait, does that make sense? So that's a pretty powerful one. Yeah. Talk about that one then. So, uh, I mean, under, or like, I don't even know what the right word, like taking in the concept that we are not supposed to have pleasant emotions and sensations 24 seven culture wise. That's not really like where our culture is right now. Um, we, we tend to want to go towards more pleasant emotions and the unpleasant ones, you know, not so much. And so he is saying that stop only focusing on the pleasant and when an unpleasant emotion comes in, acknowledge it and let it go. And that's kind of part of like that meditation training, like the whole thought enters your mind, you, you know, take it in, but then let it move on out of your mind, all of, of that for um, those of you that have practiced meditation. But I, I think that's, again, very powerful that acknowledging that at no point were we supposed to always only yeah. have positive emotions and be completely comfortable 100% of the time. Oh, bummer. I know. We have, we, we, um, I don't remember if we named it this, but you remember when you, you made the very profound statement that discomfort is not fatal. Yes. You were, you yeah. were, you were practicing or, um, training for a, a run. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. the fact that like, you know, there's a lot of discomfort, but you have to do it anyway. Yeah. That yes. is really powerful. We do, I mean, Freud, the pleasure principle, right? Like we don't, we don't want to feel bad things. Yeah. I mean, and I, I do think that, that, that this absolutely helps, you know, meditation, mindfulness. I think it helps us handle those things better, mm -hmm. get through them better, but it's not going to make them pleasant. So there was a study, um, and I might not have all the details exactly right, but I will find it and put a link. It was a study on regular meditators. And I feel like we should pause for a minute. I don't think I've done a great job of talking about meditation. Mindfulness is just being present in the moment, experiencing meditation is a practice and it can be, it's usually meditating on something. So it could be meditating on scripture. It could be most religious um, most religious bodies have a practice of some sort of meditation where you just, you're thinking on something, but you can incorporate 
the two. And, and I'll put a link I've been building. I don't know if I've told you this, but so on my YouTube channel, I've been building a lot of different meditation. The first one that I did with teachers a few years ago, Michelle, we've done this together. It's a three minute meditation and it's focusing on the woman's voice and breathing. And that was the first time I had done that regularly. And I started doing it every day. I loved it. But then I wanted something Christian. So then I found some Christian where it's meditating on verses, on scripture. It's focusing something. It's focusing your mind on something. And now I have probably 10 of them on there. They range from three minutes to seven minutes. And in my life right now, that's about as much time. That's where I am. Like if I look at something that's 20 minutes, it's going to overwhelm me. So I don't know. It's been about a year and a half. And even in all that time, seven minutes is about the longest I'm doing in the morning. (laughs) And that's an important point that don't um, make it sustainable for your life. Because if you plan something that you don't have time for, it's just going to go by the wayside. So what a good point to, to make sure that it fits in your life. Yeah. And you're going to be like, oh, I have to do this again. Um, But this study, going back to that, was on regular meditators versus non-meditators. And what they were looking at, they were delivering a painful stimulus, like it was some sort of heat delivered to the arm. And then they were measuring brain activity. And, And there was a a tone or something that let them know like 10 seconds ahead of time. Again, maybe not the details, right. But there was a tone that let them know ahead of time that the pain was going to come. All right. The non-meditators, as soon as that tone happened and they knew it was coming, there was a spike in their brain activity. Um, I don't remember which part of the brain, but there was like this fear. Oh, I know it's coming. And then there was a spike again with the pain. And then it took a while for that to go away. The meditators did not spike until the pain happened. And then it went away very quickly. The point being is they were able to be just in the moment and not focusing on the pain until the pain, like the pain was still the pain for both groups. They experienced the pain spike in the brain activity. But for the people who regularly meditated, They were able to not focus on that before it happened, and they were able to come down for it from it more quickly, which to your point about if you're in a like a crisis moment, you may not be able to be mindful, but you can maybe come down from it more quickly and be able to regroup. It was a really interesting study. I loved it. I probably just botched it all to heck. I forgot about it till we were just talking. But no, I think it it, it makes like perfect sense. And um, we had talked before about um, like the real and imagined fear concept and how that also translates to um, worry, stress, um, anxiety, like real and imagined fear being. I had um, a really wonderful therapist once who told me that um, and it was about I had something really pretty difficult and scary going on. And she acknowledged that she did not minimize that at all, but said that, okay, if you, if you think about like, if you're in a park and you're having a picnic and a bear comes up, it's always a bear. Sorry. It's always a bear. Yes. It's always yes. A bear. I mean, and I like <laughs> bears, but, and she's like, you know, then that that's real fear. But if you spend the rest of your life sitting in the park, worried about the bears going to come up, even though, bears are scary. That's um, what she referred to as imagined fear. Mm -hmm. And you can ruin your life focused on imagined fear. And it's really the same thing when it comes to, um, to anything like is what you're experiencing at the moment. Is it happening at the present moment? Just like the pain stimulus versus the fear of it. And so it sounds like the people who actively practice meditation didn't engage in that fear part until it actually happened. So they were much better at distinguishing between that real and imagined. Right. Stimulus. The anticipation. The anticipation. Yeah. And so, I mean, and I'll, I'll never forget her saying, if you spend all of your life worried when there's no bear, then, you know, that could ruin your life. So. He, the, the chatter guy, 
Ethan, he tells a story about, I think it was him. Oh, I've been listening to a lot of things lately. I think it was him that he had gotten a letter as a threat and he was a um, professor and a lot of people in his realm of what he did had, you know, it was pretty common to get some threatening things, but he wound up like staying up all night and sitting like with, I think he had a baseball bat and he was just like waiting and waiting and waiting. It went in for a lo- went on for a long, long time. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Waiting for the bear. Yeah. And it never came. Yeah. And um, I mean, and I don't mind sharing that experience. I may have shared this before previously, but um, I had received a threat and my therapist acknowledged that it was a real, a real threat. I mean, someone had threatened my life and she was like, you know, you have to do everything you can to be diligent. But other than that, you got to live your life. You did share that, but I forgot that was the situation that you were talking about. Yeah. Wow. Well, okay. So we've talked about why it's hard to live in the present. We've talked about being aware of your thoughts, trying to kind of harness them. Mindfulness versus meditation. Of course, on the activity sheet, which I will put together in final format and send to you. But there are there are five different activities. Um, the last The last thing, really, I mean, I know we've jumped around a lot. But I feel like there were a couple of things. Um, were there other things that you wanted to mention in the module? Because I had some things to close with. Oh, flow. Living in the state of flow. That's why at relating in the film of uh, positive psychology, when they talk about engagement. And we talked to one of the former modules about flow, that idea where you're in the premise, present moment and you're so immersed in something that you kind of lose track of time. Um, I thought it was interesting, these nine characteristics of flow. Should we read them? Yes. Um, go ahead and read them. And then let's see if like there's any, if you, if you agree with all of them. There's a couple that I was like, hmm, I don't know. You're not sure? Yeah. Okay. And I, I had a couple of examples where I feel like I'm in flow. Okay. So being in the state of flow, meaning you're absorbed, time passes by, you don't, you just, you're completely immersed. So nine characteristics to know that you're in the state of flow. Number one, the task is challenging enough to keep you engaged. Number two, your concentration is totally fixated on the task being performed. Number three, there are no distractions around you. You are entirely absorbed in your work. I feel like that one should be, you're not distracted. I mean, there's always going to be distractions. Right, right. Number four, while immersed in the activity, you feel a general sense of well-being. Number five, you feel totally in control. Number six, you no longer think about yourself. You have no worries or concerns. Thoughts are virtually non-existent. I'm assuming they mean thoughts outside of what you're doing. Number seven, you feel no stress or anxiety because you are positively captivated by the task. Number eight, your perception of time changes. Minutes seem to be hours and hours seem to be minutes. And number nine, a deep feeling of happiness permeates within you. So tell me which ones were bugging you. Well, there's a lot of them. I feel like in, I feel like. I'm super excited that that work is generally like this for me. And so I'm, I feel like that's a huge blessing. Yeah. It's not always. I mean, so I think that that's definitely a thing, but at the same time, like. You're not sure that all of these are a hundred percent true. I think that like they definitely, like in my experience, um, time can pass pretty quickly at certain times, but overall, now that I'm looking at them and kind of rethinking them, I think most of them are. Okay. That kind of what you said, like distractions. Yeah. I mean, we all have, distractions. we all have timelines, so it can feel like, you know, but we, we all still kind of have to keep track of, of time when it comes to, to things, but I think they are actually really right on. I'm changing my mind. Okay. okay. Yeah, changing, changing your mind. Maybe with just a little tweaks, but yeah, I think we both, you and I have flow. Um, I just wrote down two things because 
they talk about here, you can have, for example, it's not that these are, you know, all inclusive, but you can have flow in sports, you can have flow at work, you can have flow in education. And again, going back how they all, all these modules connect when it said flow in education. And for both Michelle and me, one of our top five strengths, strengths in this case being the things that really give you like, like well-being and happiness when you're living in them. And we both had love of learning, right? Yes. It was one of our top five. Yes. So one of the things I wrote, and we've talked about, I swear I feel like this big crush fan girl, but since I've discovered Christy McClellan, the Bible teacher we talked about, when I, so flow in education, when I'm listening to her podcast or when I'm reading a new book that I've gotten from her, and I'm just like making notes and looking and totally in flow, and then flow at work, so I'm writing this curriculum for the EAP program that I work for on social determinants of health. And when I'm learning and working and creating that, I'm just like, before I know it, time has passed. Um, so I, I agree for the most part with a lot of these things too, especially where there's no anxiety. Um, there's just a feeling of, of happiness and contentment. Things don't distract me. You know, I'm fixated. I definitely don't think about myself. Um, so I don't know if I feel like it's a hundred percent, all these things, but when we're in a sense of flow, that's a little bit of being like present in the moment and focusing on what you're doing. And it gives us a sense of happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts about that? I don't think so. Okay. The only other thing I wanted to end with, um, is again, going back to, I said, I was going to pull a few other things from the chatter part. And I'm going to just read this list. I, I hope that you all will. One of the things I loved about this book. So he talks about this concept of chatter in our inner voice. And he talks about mindfulness and a lot of other things. But then the last chapter it takes it to. It's like, OK, so you're telling me what it is now. How do I overcome that? And he has these 12 things, some of which I had not really thought about. So I'm just going to read them and maybe make a point or two. But so these are the techniques, he says, to keep your self-talk from spiraling into chatter, which is the chatter is where it just it instead of accessing your inner positive voice, it accesses your inner critic. So number one, we've talked a little bit about this distance self-talk. So, for example, um, let's think of a good example of that people might connect with for chatter overall or for a, a voice that's not, what would be a good example of a voice that's holding them back? Something work or parent related or that might begin with the I. Like in terms of like the negative self-talk? Yeah. yeah. All right. I think um, like one of the things is like speaking up or like voicing your ideas. I think sometimes people... Um, I mean, even like myself at, at times, like can be like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, oh you're not going to listen to that. Oh, that didn't make any sense. Like okay. all of, of those things. Let's just do, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say those things. I shouldn't have said that. So shifting from first person to you or he or she creates a distance. So even saying to yourself, talking to yourself that way, um, Let's change that still even a little bit more. Huh? What were you thinking when you said that? You know, what were you? So it's talking using the you or even the he or she. So it's instead of talking about your problems in the first person, like I felt this where I said this or I did this, referring to yourself as you, it's a distance way to look at yourself. And we've talked about that Harvard study where referring to yourself as your own name, which is Tammy and Michelle don't like that, but anyway, we're okay with it. Um, it reduces rumination, creates emotional distance, and helps you move past that. Number two, advising a friend. So imagine yourself talking to a friend and what advice would you give them? Number three, broaden your perspective. So just doing a comparison of what you're going through right now to some of your other life, life events just helps you to gain perspective. It helps your brain to put like emotional intensity into perspective as to where this falls and what you've been through. Um, stop me anytime, by the way. 
Number four, reframe as a challenge. So instead of seeing things, if you reframe what you're going on, this one, we I think we've heard before, calling it a challenge instead of a threat helps your body to interpret it differently. Number five, as you focus on your body responses, reframe, reinterpret them like those physical symptoms, rapid heart rate, that kind of thing. Um, remind yourself that they are adaptive responses meant to help you improve under pressure. So instead of seeing them as awful, knowing that they're designed to help you. Number six, this is one I've been teaching a lot lately, normalizing the experience. So in recognizing that your experience is not unique, but a common human challenge. For example, grief, um, recognizing that grief is a normal thing people go through makes you feel less alone. And that was really helped me a lot. Recognizing that anxiety is a human experience for many people. And it just helps me feel more connected. Um, number seven, mentally time traveling. So going, he talks a lot about going back and thinking about your ancestors and what they went through and your parents just to time travel and then going forward. How am I going to feel about this in a month or a year? Um, which helps, em it emphasizes the impermanence of your emotional states. Number eight, this is really cool too. Change the view. Visualize yourself as a fly on a wall, um, zooming out to look at the whole scene so it distance yourself. Number nine, expressive writing. Writing for 15 or 20 minutes a day. That is not happening for me. But anyway, that one does speak to me right away. I'm also going to visualize myself as a butterfly. I don't want to be a fly. Go oh, ahead. Oh, a butterfly. I'm going to write that down. A butterfly on the wall. Michelle, that was so cool. Um, number 10, adopt a neutral third party perspective. So if you're in a conflict with someone, assuming the third party view helps quiet your inner critic. And number 11, this is another one that I, there were a few that were new to me. Um, lucky charms and rituals. Yesterday on my work teams meeting, we were talking about rosaries. Now I'm not saying a rosary is a lucky charm. And, and he, I don't know why that he calls it lucky charms, but having something that is a ritual, it could be religious, it could be spiritual, it could be having something that you touch and hold or a ritual that have com could come from your family, from your religion. It could come from something you create yourself. Maybe it's a butterfly that you hold on to. <laughs> I mean, it could be anything. So that's it. I know that was quick, but I think those are, those are wonderful. Those are wonderful. Like, have you ever, uh, you have no um, anxiety around speaking at all, but that is, you know, social anxiety is something I've shared that I've definitely um, struggled with, especially in the past. And so I have found it so helpful to like hold something in my hand, like a penny when mm. I'm speaking, it's very grounding. It's very calming. And you never yeah. told me that. Yeah. It's, but uh, but no, let me back up. I do have anxiety related to speaking. <laughs> I mean, you you but you you didn't you don't seem anxious at all. But like, I don't know what it is. But like holding that in, in uh, holding something in my hands really helpful. And this all goes back to nothing is like. I mean, there are a few things that we've learned that have surprised us or that we hadn't heard before. We can always learn something new, but even the things that we already knew were things, if we don't engage in them, they're not going to be helpful. They're not helpful. Yeah. So, and even just the awareness that, oh, that penny or whatever does help me. So I should remember to do that, you know, to have something I sh because that calms me and that helps me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, we did it. What do you think? Are we done? Module eight. It's going fast. Two more. I know. I know. And so, I, you know, I looked ahead. Number nine is is about relationships and gratitude. And then number 10, just so everybody knows, is like a recap. So I think on number 10, we should bring like food and um, have like. I don't remember this time. Number yeah. 10. We're It'll be a celebration. Last time you brought brownies and I brought nothing. Well, that's true. That's true.
That yeah. Was- but number 10, I am going to remember. Maybe we should try to be together for number 10. Oh, that would be good. All right. We'll talk about that offline. Figure it out. If we okay. can. Michelle and I live like an hour apart, which isn't like awful, but it is not only is an hour apart, it's I'm on one side of Nashville and she's on the other side of Nashville. And if any of you have been here lately, traffic is uh, different than it was five years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. Especially depending on when you're, when you're going. We have a meeting space in between, but that wouldn't work to record a podcast because it's too noisy. We tried in the, you know, recording one in the car once that didn't work. And remember the one we record in your friend's gym? Oh yes, and the, we, the sound wasn't good in there either. Yeah. That was awful. I don't know what we were thinking. We'll figure it out. I think we even went through a Chick Fil A line once. We did. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm having such good memories. We did. Go- <laughs> well, we tried. We tried. We tried many things. We try. Yeah. We really try to make things fun and engaging, and so uh-huh. we are who we are. All right. You never know. You never know what you're going to get. You never know what you're going to get. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And keep sharing. I've noticed during our modules this time, we have more likes and we have more shares and we have more downloads. And so please keep doing that. You know, I hope because after this, we're going to revisit and see like Michelle and I aren't, co- aren't hosting regularly anymore. But after this, I don't know. Maybe we will go back to doing that. We'll see if she wants to. But I do like doing this this like the series because we've just learned a lot and it seems like you all like it too so download subscribe share play send us messages follow us on you know facebook and if you're a woman follow us in the consider yourself no yeah consider yourself hugged group and yeah thank you thank you for being here and i guess until we're together next time Consider Consider yourself yourself hugged. Bye.